to cancel that. Okay. Um, good. Um, and if um, folks um, could mute themselves, that will help avoid some feedback. And um, I'm, my message is going to be muddled enough um, without feedback. Feedback probably won't help. All right. So let's start in the beginning. Um, in August of 1876, G.K. Gobert um, was um, at that point a young uh, geologist working for the Powell Survey. He was later, of course, to become one of the iconic North American uh, geologists of all time. But in um, August 1876, he was riding north on horseback um, in the far northern edge of, of the Great Basin. And he reports in his field book that I can see red rock and beyond it. It surely looks as though there has been a current through. And then running closer, the red rock is only one of a number that are here exceptionally bared in testimony to the stream that has washed them in degrading this pass. So I would assert that this recording in his August 16th, 1876 field book is the first North American mega flood observation. So let's um, um, step back for some, some context. And I'm going to hopefully, let's see, hopefully there's a laser pointer there now working. Um, at the peak of the last ice age, say 20 to 15,000 years ago, these great ice sheets were growing over North America. The Laurentide ice sheet had um, centered over Hudson Bay, and then the Cordilleran ice sheet, which grew from the um, um, Canadian coast range and the Canadian Rockies. And both these ice sheets sent lobes to the south. And um, in our part of the world, we're mostly concerned with the Cordilleran ice sheet, which of course sent a, lube, a lobe down Puget Sound, bearing Seattle by kilometers of ice. But the most interesting lobe was one that came down the Purcell Trench, uh, occupying the basin now filled with Lake Ponderay. And that lobe, of course, um, dammed Glacial Lake Missoula, uh, which we all know and love. Um, so this is an ice dammed lake. And there were other ice dammed lakes, too. Um, uh, associated with these ice sheets, but Glacial Lake Missoula was the most important of those. Um, but in addition to the ice dammed lakes, there were also uh, what were called pluvial lakes. And these are lakes that formed in the closed basins of, of, the, of the Great Basin. And these lakes formed because temperatures got cooler and precipitation inc increased. And as a consequence, there was less evaporation, and these lakes would grow in the closed basins. And the two largest ones were the Lahontan, um, Pluville Lake Lahontan, um, centered over Pyramid Lake and in western Nevada. But the largest was the predecessor to Great Salt Lake, Pluvial Lake Bonneville. And this lake um, ended up growing to cover about half of um, half of Utah, um, Utah, most of Western Utah, with about 10,000 cubic kilometers of water. So what was Gilbert doing at the far north end of, of Pluvial Lake Bonneville? And this is a, a map of, of Lake Bonneville that he published a few years later in his 1890 monograph um, on, on the lake. And these lines are the tracks that he and his field assistants um, took in examining various features of this large Pleistocene pluvial lake. What Gilbert was doing was looking for outlets. And he knew that there had to be an outlet 
he actually knew that there had to be two outlets at different elevations. And he knew that because of the strong shorelines etched along the sides of the mountains rimming this lake. The high one here he called the Bonneville shoreline. In his notebook, he labeled it DB. Um, and then a lower one called the um, later become known as the Provo shoreline. And the fact that these strongly formed shorelines were there meant that the lake had to have an outlet. If you think about it, um, um, uh, shoreline forms because the lake is at a certain elevation, elevation for, for some length of time so that the wave action can, can etch out um, a, a level horizon. Um, if a lake is just um, reflecting the balance between evaporation and precipitation, much like Great Salt Lake does, its elevation keeps varying with, with the annual climate. Um, and doesn't really stay in one place for a long time. And you don't get these firmly etched shorelines. So the fact that there were these two shorelines um, um, spurred Brett's to search all around the perimeter of the basin looking for outlets. And this was <coughs> um, 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 this clue is what um, of the shorelines motivated his, his search. And here's a view of these shorelines um, from the air. Here is the Bonneville shoreline up high here. And then there's the prominent bench here, the Provo shoreline that sits about 300 feet below the Bonneville shoreline. So we can compare the Bonneville situation to glacial Lake Missoula, which did not have a stable outlet. It had the ice dam as an outlet, which was notoriously unstable. There are shorelines associated with glacial Lake Missoula. And here's a view of shorelines etched on Mount Jumbo outside of um, the town of Missoula. But these shorelines aren't very common. And they're not very strongly formed. You only see them uh, when the lighting and sometimes the snow conditions are, are just right. And that's because there was no single level that Glacial Lake Missoula stabilized at. Each of these shorelines here is probably a season, reflects a seasonal occupation of the lake at that level. So let's even consider an even more transient um, lake situation close to home. Here is the namesake of your chapter, Lake Lewis, in a diagram um, made by Bruce Bjornstad. And um, Lake Lewis, um, of course, formed hydraulically behind the constriction of Lula Gap. And as, I, as far as I know, there are no evident shorelines for Lake Lewis. Really the only sign of Lake Lewis are the valley bottom deposits, the rhythmites that you see in places, and then the stranded ice rapted erratics that, that define its maximum level. And that's because Lake Lewis was not even there for a season. It may have only been there for at its maximum levels for an hour or two as flow came into the Pasco Basin and was funneling out through the Lula Gap. So Gilbert is looking for an outlet and he comes up to Red Rock Pass in far southeastern Idaho and he traces the Bonneville shoreline to, to the north through Red Rock Pass and beyond. But the bottom of the pass is much lower. And it's indicated by this blue level, which is, as it turns out, the Provo level. So while Gilbert was looking for 
two outlets and trying to understand how that could happen, it really turned out there was one outlet that had two stable elevations, one high at the Bonneville level, as indicated by this blue line, and then down 300 feet lower at the Provo level, which is the elevation of the modern divide through Red Rock Pass. So this is his notes from that same day. I see Red Rock and beyond it. Red Rock is this knob right here. It surely looks as though there has been a current through, but it also looks as though the beach line that points nearby was higher than the pass and that beach line be the Provo level. So what happened here? Well, the next view is going to be Gilbert's view from standing on Marsh Creek fan, which is this alluvial fan that comes um, from the mountains to the east and crosses westward across the bottom of the valley um, towards the mountains on the west. So Gilbert is standing here and he is sketching the scene to the south. Um, here's his view. Here's Red Rock here. Here is the current elevation of the pass, which is at the Provo level. He's looking south into um, the Cache Valley and Bonneville Basin. And um, this is his borough, which he named Ways and Means. It's kind of a nice bureaucratic twist on, a, on, <clears throat> on, on his um, transportation vehicle. And, um, um, and from the air, this is what the situation looks like. This is the surface of Red Rock Pass as it extended to the west, right in this view. Um, here's Red Rock here. Here is the current pass with highway going through it, looking south into the Bonneville Basin. So, so what happened here? And why, how did these two different outlet elevations um, come to be? Well, um, what Gilbert figured out, and I'll, I'll um, state his words here in a second, but um, I'll try to stumble through in my own words first to provide some context is that this Marsh Creek fan here it used to extend all the way across the valley. And then as Lake Bonneville was rising because conditions were wetter and cooler and there was more flow coming in than there was evaporating, it finally rose to an elevation where it overtopped the saddle created by this Marsh Creek fan against the mountains on the west and the water started trickling over the side here. But once it started flowing over, this alluvial material was pretty easy to erode and it started eroding quickly down. And it eroded down about 100 meters until it stabilized on lower limestone at what it turns out to be the Provo level. And it was that release of water, about half of the total volume of pluvial Lake Bonneville, about 500,000 cubic kilometers, which caused the Bonneville flood. So let me um, just read what Gilbert wrote, um, describing what happened at, at the outlet, because um, his story, uh, while um, um, has, has stood the test of time. The fact that the Bonneville water discharged at first over a barrier of alluvium instead of solid rock had much to do with the subsequent history of the lake. Uncemented alluvium is easily and rapidly torn up and removed. And as soon as a current began to flow across the divide, it must have commenced the excavation of a channel. As the channel increased, the volume of the escaping water became greater. And this increase of volume reacted on the power of erosion. In a short time, a mighty river was formed 
and the lowering of the lake surface resulted. For a time, the outpouring was a veritable debacle and it could not have assumed the phase of an ordinary river commensurate with the inflow of the lake until the alluvial barrier was completely demolished and the resistance of the limestone reef was called into play. So as I said, once the alluvial fan was overtopped, it was eroded, eroded quite quickly, down dropping the lake level um, about 300 feet or 100 meters. A couple interesting things here. One is he describes it as a mighty river and also the outpouring as a veritable debacle, but he never uses the word flood. And I've wondered, I've wondered for a long time as to maybe that's why the Bonneville flood was lost um, to history for several decades after. And I'll get into that in just a minute. So, but first I just wanna do a quick little poorly constructed comparison with the Missoula floods because we're, we're more familiar with those. So this is um, a couple of hydrographs with discharge on the left and time in days on the right. And these are hydrographs that aim to model the process that Gilbert described, this accelerating overflow as the Marsh Creek fan was eroded, it peaks once it fully deepens, and then as the water drains out, it slowly comes out. And depending on the modeling parameters, the hydrograph can, can vary. But the important points are that the peak discharge was about a million cubic meters per second, and the duration of the flood was measured in tens of days, months even. Um, and let's compare that to the Missoula flood. Um, and this isn't discharge, this is just a simply stage. But what I'll say is despite the largest Missoula flood being half the volume of our um, um, half the volume of the Bonneville flood, it had a peak discharge that was 20 or 30 times greater. And as a consequence, its duration was much shorter. So recent modeling we've been doing um, shows a flood increasing rapidly as the ice dam collapses. And then within a hundred or so hours, the flood is over. So here, this little square here represents 100 hours on the Bonneville flood. The Bonneville flood, um, twice as much water, um, a tenth to a thirtieth of the peak discharge and a duration that was several times longer. And these different characteristics of the Bonneville flood compared to the Missoula flood make a difference in, in what some of the downstream features look like. So when did the Bonneville flood occur? Um, it happened during the last ice age and, um, and the best information on the age of the flood comes from radiocarbon dating of lake deposits. And this has been mainly done by um, Jack Oviatt, University of Kansas. And here's time going from right to left in this case, 30,000 years ago to the end of the Pleistocene around 10,000 years ago. And as climate got cooler and wetter, the lake kind of episodically grew, it, well, grew in fits and starts until it hit the Bonneville shoreline. And then um, was only up at this level for um, a short time, maybe a few years or a few decades, long enough to carve that prominent Bonneville shoreline. But then it, the flood occurred and dropped down to the Provo level. And the radiocarbon dates that constrain this lake history um, basically come to the conclusion that this flood must have occurred 
about 18,000 years ago, plus or minus a few hundred years. About the same time as the first of the Missoula floods. Okay, so Gilbert describes this veritable debacle in USGS monograph number one that was published in 1890. And then the flood disappears. Um, uh, no one recognizes the flood until the 1950s. And that has always been a little bit of a mystery um, to me. And it's especially one element that's especially mysterious is the fact that just a few years after um, Gilbert um, worked out the situation of the overflow and the veritable debacle out the outlet, Israel Cook Russell was working on the geology of the Snake River Plain downstream. Of course, the Bonneville overflow, um, I neglected to say, went into the Snake River um, Basin via first Marsh Creek, which built out the fan, then the Portneuf River, and then joining the Eastern Snake River Plain in the vicinity of Pocatello, then following the Snake River down towards the Columbia. Well, I see Russell is working on the Snake River Plain within the decade or two after G.K. Gilbert's study. He even takes pictures of flood transported boulders in the Hagerman area in the Snake River Plain, but does not clue into the fact that these boulders were deposited from the overflow of Pluvial Lake Bonneville. And what's especially surprising about this is if you remember the map of G.K. Gilbert and his field assistants traversing all back and forth, up and down the, the, the Bonneville Basin, his primary field assistant was none other than Israel Cook Russell. Why Russell um, did not um, um, carry the flood story downstream is, is a mystery. A few years later, um, another prominent um, US Geological Survey geologist, Harold Stearns um, did a report on the Snake River Plain. This one published in 1932. He also took photographs of the boulder deposits left by the flood, but again, attributed them to some other process um, besides the, the Lake Bonneville overflow. It wasn't until the 1950s um, when Harold Maldi and Harold Powers, two geologists working on the quaternary geology of the Snake River Plain, linked the overflow of Lake Bonneville to the colossal features of erosion deposition downstream. And um, Hal, Harold Maldi, Hal Maldi, um, uh, summarized this work in a masterful professional paper published in 19. 68. And I'll just have to say that it's, it was this paper that that inspired my work in the Snake River Plain in the late 80s, trying to quantify the relationships between some of these features of erosion and deposition with the flow conditions. So um, one little side story, which I think is kind of fun, is, you know, this <coughs> geologist work with geological formations and, um, um, and to formally name a geologic formation, you have to name it after a place. And <clears throat> Molly, uh, uh, enchanted by these boulder deposits um, along the Snake River, um, named them, gave them the formation name, the Melon Gravel. And he named it after Melon Valley, which is a little bit west of Twin Falls. And I've always wondered if Maldi actually 
had that valley named himself so that he could name this gravel the melon gravel. And the reason why he wanted to name the gravel the melon gravel was um, um, because he was inspired by what he described as this whimsical billboard that advertised one patch of these boulders as petrified watermelons. And so in the earlier paper, um, how Maldine Harold Powers um, formally named them um, the melon gravel. Well, that sign, um, um, I was fortunate enough in the, in the late 80s when I was starting my work there um, to be toured around the area by Hal Maldi himself. And he took me to this sign. Um, it's on old US Highway 30, um, not um, uh, west, of, west of Twin Falls, along the valley bottom. It's the back of a stinker gas station sign. And these stinker gas station signs, um, um, there's several of them there that have these kind of odd things on the back of them. And this was the sign that inspired um, um, Maldi's melon gravel um, name. I was um, newly married at the time and I thought, well, that kind of looks like a good idea. So I did one, I took one home to my mother-in-law. I don't think that made her next move though. So um, after Maldi rediscovered the flood, um, several other people started recognizing features along the Snake River, um, um, all the way between Pocatello and Lewiston and beyond that could be attributed to the Bonneville flood. And my, my work, my PhD thesis published in 1993 was just one of many, many such studies. Um, so here is the, the flood route. Here is Red Rock Pass at the far north end of Pluvial Lake Bonneville. The flood followed Marsh Creek, then the Portneuf River spilling out to the Snake River Plain um, as I said, near Pocatello, then followed the plain, some places spilling out of the canyon, particularly where it was narrow, um, but mostly confined to the canyon um, and um, <clears throat> um, until the Western Snake River Plain where again it spread out behind the constriction at Farrell Bend at the entrance to the long narrow Hell's Canyon reach. Um, <clears throat> down the Lewiston, and flood features can be traced down the Snake River as far as Lower Granite Dam. Um, so um, that's the path of the flood. And of course, the Missoula floods are back flooding up the, up the Snake River as far as, well, actually as far as Pittsburgh Landing right in this bend of, of the Snake River and Hell's Canyon. So in profile, the, the flood route looks like this. It's not an even gradient. Here is the modern um, um, river channels from um, Marsh Creek, Portneuf River, Snake River Plain, the steep stretch um, near Twin Falls where Twin Falls and Shoshone Falls are. Um, and then the Western Snake River Plain, and then it's deep in step as it goes through Hell's Canyon. And the water surface profile of the flood here indicated in gray follows that, although there are some notable discrepancies where constrictions like the constriction impounding Lake Lewis at Wula Gap hydraulically impounded the flow. And so you get these flat areas um, um, above constrictions and then the water will shoot through them and come out lower. And one of the prominent ones is down here at Swan Falls, south of Boise in the Snake River Plain. You can see how the water surface profile just is ponded up behind it and then drops down quickly. Then it's ponded up again at the constriction at the entrance of Farewell Bend and then steep down through Hell's Canyon. And these 
constrictions impose a hydraulic control that really control the patterns of erosion and deposition. And that's what fast, that's what motivated my work there. Of course, these constrictions have motivated other uh, types of activities in the Snake River Plain as well as um, um, like Evil Knievel's famous failure to jump over the Snake River Canyon near Twin Falls. I think he broke a few bones this attempt. Um, and in these narrow areas and steep areas, the flood was erosive, just like the Missoula floods were. Here's some fluted and polished basalt um, just upstream of, of Pocatello, south of Pocatello, where the, um, um, where the flood was forced through the Portneuf Narrows. Here is the steep, narrow stretch. Um, um, I think Evil Knievel's jump was somewhere over here where the, where the canyon was so narrow that the flow spilled out onto the north side and then it was coming back in at various places, creating these nice cataract complexes, very much like the channel Scabland um, of, of Eastern Washington. Excuse me for a second. <coughs> um, this is a Bruce Bjornstadt photograph and maybe you know, but his his book, his um, photographic um, um, floodscapes book has just come out. And this photograph is one of many outstanding photographs in that book. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So this scab line is just like that of Eastern Washington, which ironically um, plays a part in the Scabland story itself. Um, <clears throat> one of J. Harlan Bretz's chief antagonists in developing the Missoula flood origin was Richard Foster Flint. And um, Flint um, argued that instead of catastrophic floods, it was leisurely streams with normal discharge, a grading and then degrading that was that created the channels, the complex of channels and deposits, particularly that of the Cheney Palouse and coming into Lake Lewis. And one of his lines of evidence was the scab land near Twin Falls, where he reports in his 1938 manifesto opposing the floods that at Shoshone Falls, just east of the city of Twin Falls, Idaho, on the Snake River Plains, the Snake River has incised a canyon more than 500 feet deep. A broad shelf on the south wall about 100 feet below the rim consists of scabland with small anastomosing channels, isolated buttes and shallow rock basins. The thin vertically jointed flows yielded to the hydraulic force of Snake River as similar flows in the Columbia Plateau yielded to the hydraulic force of pro-glacial streams. Yet I'm not aware that unusual floods have been held to have affected the upper Snake River. So this, um, if, if Gilbert, had perhaps used the word flood instead of a mighty river, if Russell had linked the terrain that he'd worked on decades previously and the overflow to the boulder deposits on the Snake River Plain, maybe the story of discovery of the Missoula flood would have taken a different turn or two. These are, of course, unanswerable questions, but they're awfully fun to think about. Okay, so um, the flood route, um, steep stretches, shallow stretches um, along the flood course, controlling the patterns of erosion and deposition, 
So I showed you some of the original features. Now let's look at some of the depositional features. Again, here's Hal Maldi guiding me um, around the um, terrain. He had just retired months before he took me out here in 1987. And he was going on to a second retirement career as a photographer for the Nature Conservancy. He was a masterful photographer. And I'm going to show you some of his photographs. This is one taken of a boulder field, again, not too far from Hagerman, west of Twin Falls. Here are sandy, um, um, festoon, cross-bedded um, deposits um, in a, a backwater area. Um, here are similar deposits. These, these are photos I took. Um, here's another Hal Maldi photo of a huge bar downstream from the Swan Falls constriction. Um, the bar is a couple of kilometers across here. These are basalt boulders here. Here is a eddy bar tucked into this reentrant. So flow is from left to right coming around this corner. Um, these boulders are big. This is so this is the bed load of the flood as it came out of the constriction from Swan Falls. This a little further upstream, here's a, a, a ground view or a boulder top view of this boulder bar. The actual Swan Falls Dam is right here. The constriction is right around the corner. This is an immense point bar with a track going up here. Um, and for scale, this is the daughter of the recipient of the petrified watermelon uh, to give you a sense of how big some of these boulders are. Here's a couple uh, more photos from the same area. This is in the Snake River Birds of Prey area, um, south of Boise. It's all public land. Um, if you're ever um, driving across the Snake River Plain and you want a diversion, um, to see mega flood features, this is absolutely a world-class spot. Um, also fun to do is to get off the interstate and take old Highway 30. That petrified watermelon sign was still there last time I went through a couple, a couple years ago. And if anybody has a more recent update, I would like to, to hear about that. In the backwater, um, flooded areas, you have fine grain deposits, just like the Missoula floods. A lot of it is, is reworked less, just like the Missoula floods, but you don't have the rhythmic beds like you do for the Missoula floods. And the reason for that, of course, is there was only one Bonneville flood as opposed to a hundred or so Missoula floods, each one leaving an individual bed. Another view of these fine grain deposits back flooding up the Boise River in the Western Snake River Plain. And <clears throat> so those slack water deposits were in this area of pretty slack water upstream of the constriction of Farrell Bend. And then down through Hell's Canyon, it's kind of interesting because you see mega flood features down here, but it's not the layered basalt flows that we're so used to looking at in, in terms of mega flood erosional depositional features. <coughs> Here is a pre Hell's Canyon dam photo looking downstream taken by Tracy Vallier in 1965. Here's the Snake River flowing away from us in this scene. And here's a big mid valley bottom bar. This is called Big Bar. The top of it still pokes out of the reservoir behind Hell's Canyon Dam. Um, the canyon is so narrow, there aren't a lot of preserved bar features, but there's enough to know that um, a big flood went through. Here's another view further downstream, just a little bit upstream from Pittsburgh Landing. This is called the Suicide Bend area, if you're familiar with Hell's Canyon. Again, we're looking downstream. This is a large point bar with a couple of full-size ponderosa pines for scale down here. And you can see the Hell's version 
um, Hell's Canyon version of Scabland going up the slope. Because the valley was so narrow here, this is really, this was the deepest part of the flood, um, despite it being quite a ways downstream from the outlet. And that's one very significant difference between the Bonneville flood and the Missoula floods, because the Missoula floods were flashy, their discharge attenuated or got smaller as it went downstream. Because the Bonneville flood was prolonged and uh, controlled by the water exiting through that relatively narrow outlet at Red Rock Pass, um, the peak discharge did not really change that much going downstream. And then exiting Hills Canyon to the north, um, here's the famous Tammany Bar um, site near Lewiston. The Bonneville flood was coming from right to left here, depositing um, um, bed load essentially in these in these north dipping forsets here, these sequences of forsets. The bar was was quite armored, which is another hallmark of the Bonneville flood, meaning that there's a quite a concentration of coarse boulders at the top. And then if it's capped by 20 some rhythmites of Missoula floods presumably a like number of Missoula floods that back flooded up the Snake River um, after the Bonneville flood. So the story of the Bonneville flood could definitely be continued. Um, there's a whole host of, of opportunities there. One um, huge opportunity revolves around um, conducting some updated hydrodynamic modeling. Of course, that was the focus of my work 30 years ago now, but the models are so much better and, um, and so much more could be done. And, and by doing um, better modeling, you can get at some fundamental mega flood questions. But first you can make the movie, which everybody wants to see the movie of the Bonneville flood. We've got preliminary movies of Missoula floods, but the Bonneville flood, I think will also um, uh, be a chart breaker. But the Bonneville flood, because it was longer and steadier, um, it is much, and it took, it was only one flood and it took primarily just one route. It was a much simpler um, situation hydraulically. And because of that, you could really do a less ambiguous analysis of identifying thresholds and processes of bedrock erosion and boulder deposition. Uh, that's uh, an opportunity that's crying out. And you can start really thinking about how do um, mega flood features like cataracts and alcoves form and develop and other controls on sediment transport deposition. How does deposit stratigraphy um, and morphology relate to flow dynamics? Those are general mega flood questions that the Bonneville flood is ideally suited for, um, more so than most other mega floods because it was a, such a st steadier and drawn out flood compared to others. These are opportunities that are just, uh, that are, in my opinion, crying out to be done. And then there's, there's more specific questions relating to the flood and the flood route itself. Was this narrow canyon east of Twin Falls, a canyon that Evil Knievel tried to jump over, was that canyon actually fully carved by the flood? I think it could have been, but um, that's still an open question. We do know that the canyon that's um, in the Massacre Rocks area was carved by the floods. And prior to the Monteville flood, the Snake River Channel was to the north. I think the same situation could have happened with this steep stretch where Twin Falls and Shoshone Falls and where Evil Knievel um, attempted to jump. Um, across. I think that canyon could have been carved by the floods too, but that's still an open question. There are these, these alcoves um, where, and 
cataracts where the second channel came in, but there's other ones too along the course. And some of them could have been from floods that came down, say the Wood River or even the Big Lost River. We know there were outburst floods that came down these rivers from ice dammed lakes up in the, um, um, in, in the Sawtooth in, in the Idaho um, Batholith country. And um, we know that the Bonneville flood, at least at Lewiston, predated some 20 Missoula floods, but did it predate all the Missoula floods? The timing is close. As I said earlier, uh, the Bonneville flood uh, occurred at about 18,000 years ago, plus or minus um, a few hundred years. Um, 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 and the earliest dates that we have, reliable dates that I think are reliable on the Missoula floods are about the same, about the same time. So I see I have one final slide here. Just to, um, because we all know so much about the Missoula floods and the Bonneville floods a little forgotten. I just want to do a couple, just summarize a couple key comparative points. Um, the Bonneville flood was bigger, twice as big as the largest Missoula flood, at least in terms of the total volume of, of water. Um, but this peak discharge was a 20th of that um, of the largest Missoula flood. So as a consequence, the Bonneville's flood, the Bonneville flood's duration was weeks or months compared to just a few days for the Missoula floods. There's no giant current dunes <clears throat> on Bonneville flood deposits. And I think that's because the flow is much steadier. It wasn't up and down like the Missoula floods were. Bonneville flood was a singular event. The overflow um, um, eroded the divide. And once it eroded down to the Provo level, the lake was stabilized on the bedrock threshold there. The further lowering of Lake Bonneville to Great Salt Lake was by evaporation, exceeding the inflow into the basin. Both of these floods um, complexes, the Missoula floods and the Bonneville floods have been instrumental for um, our global understanding of meg mega floods. And perhaps the most important attribute they both have is in the backwater areas, they have produced great hops growing soils. So if um, I'm not sure how you do this, but that's all I have. And um, I'd be more than happy to take questions if there's time for that. Absolutely. Thank you so much for um, presenting. It was really, really informative. And I know I really enjoyed it. I know I want to go and check out that petrified watermelon sign. That's for sure. <laughs> that sounds super cool. Well, I wanted to uh, thank you, uh, um, Jim. I, I saw you give a talk similar at the Northwest Science in Lewiston. And uh, that was uh, that was awesome, but I got an awful lot out of this one as well. It's it's amazing how um, you can hear the story a number of times, but each time you know you you are giving me more and more details and more more and more understanding. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate that. That I'm sure the story changes a, a fair bit every time because I think of. I make up new things as I go, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but, but I appreciate those comments. I have Jim. a comment, not a question, but I really appreciated those hydrographic plots you made, which showed a great deal of the difference between the character of the two uh, floods. Thank you. I really need to redo those to to make the scales and information parallel um, um, you know, between them. But um, I'm, I'm glad they still made the point. They made the point, but I, I, first time I think I've seen them used on these floods. Oh. 
I'm sure they have been, but I, I haven't seen it. Jim, are the, is the evidence for the Bonneville flood at Granite Dam a few erratic cobbles? Um, um, no, it's more than that, actually. There's a boulder bar down there, um, and um, it's on river left on the south side that is um, um, in the lee of, of, of a pretty significant bend just downstream, if I recall correctly, just downstream from the dam. And it's a place that Kurt Othberg took me to several years ago. Um, and he's, he's the one who really um, um, identified it as such. So I wanna make sure that he is a credit, but it, it's, it's upstream of the uppermost direct entry of Missoula floodwaters into the Snake River. So, um, and, and downstream from there, everything is gonna be mangled, of course. And this bar is chock full of Hell's Canyon lithologies, in particular the greenstones that are so common um, um, in Hell's Canyon. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I've got a, a, another question there. <laughs> a question um, of the Missoula flood deposits at Tammany Bar. Um, do you know what the youngest Missoula flood, uh, is there any dates for the Missoula flood deposits? No, um, there, there aren't there. Um, several years ago, I went there with the idea of, of um, looking at that contact very closely, the Missoula flood rhythmites on top of the Bonneville gravel to see if I could see any evidence of time and actually to maybe attempt some, some optically stimulated luminescence dating there, um, OSL dating there. But it seems like that, that contact um, right on top of the Bonneville flood bar is almost at least everywhere I get access to it is been invaded by, um, well, I guess I, would, I was going to say clastic dikes, but they're, since they're horizontal, they're sills. They're basically clastic sills. These fluidized areas of Missoula flood sand have been injected laterally along that contact. And so there's no, there's no clean setting um, I'm sort of an idiot stratigrapher. I can only figure things out if they're obvious and things weren't obvious there. So I bailed. <laughs> so uh, Jim, uh, Gary Ford here. There's a, a lot of uh, discussions about the amount of Missoula sediment that uh, went out into the ocean. Uh, what can you tell me about uh, how far the Bonneville flood sediments have been identified? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a good question. As far as I can tell, <clears throat> no one's been able to trace Bonneville flood deposits or features downstream of Lower Granite Dam, even out into the Pacific. Um, you know, that, that the situation is that, you know, the Bonneville flood was, was a tenth the size of the Missoula floods. And so its features, you know, there probably are sediment layers out in the ocean that um, um, were from the Bonneville flood, but they're, they're overwhelmed by Missoula flood features. So that said about deposits, but what is interesting is, is there, some of the marine geologists have been studying the, the critters living in the, um, in the seafloor at, you know, during the last ice age. 
And what they've noticed at about 18,000 years ago um, is that there was a huge pulse of fresh water um, um, diatoms that came into some of these marine basins um, about that time. And of course, they speculate that it could have been Missoula floods, but I would think it's even more likely at that time frame that the Bonneville flood, which involved a much larger volume of water um, and probably one that was much more diatom rich than ice dam glacial like Missoula, that that water could have been the source of the diatom signature out there. So no clear sedimentologic signature um, in the um, <clears throat> in, in, in the cores from the Eastern Pacific, um, but perhaps a water, um, a water quality <clears throat> signature, so to speak. And I should say that the Missoula flood sediments extend out thousands of kilometers um, into the abyssal ocean floor, you know, twice as long as the route from Glacial Lake Missoula to, to um, the um, mouth of the Columbia. Thank you. All right, I think that's about it. Well, thank you so much. I really, um, I really appreciate your time and uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing everybody in a couple months for our next lecture, but thank you everybody for joining. Thanks for listening. I, um, it's always fun to do these things and these questions were, um, are always good too. So thank you. Thank you, Jim. Oh, thank you, Jim. Oh, thank you, Jim. Matt. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thanks, Liz.